Uh, I'm so honored to be here today. It's just a great honor to speak to this genealogical society, which meant would have meant so much to my father, and I know he'd be so proud that I'm that I'm doing this today. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to my father today. It's the um, he's the subject of both my books, and um, he's my check link uh, to the world. And what I've uh, been experiencing for the last decade, really working on this project, I. Um, uh, but in 2008, kind of shifted gears and, and began to work with this collection, which I'm going to tell you about, and also um, really kind of find meaning as to why this story matters. So I think it's true with all of history, we should all learn from the past and, and try and create a better world with what we learn and know better. And this one really helps you uh, know a lot about the refugee crisis, which, of course, around the world right now, there's a, a big emphasis on what we do about migrants for all different kind of reasons that people are spreading out around the world. But um, particularly, it's relevant to my father's story and a lot of common things that happened back at that time. My personal background is, is that I grew up on an island in Florida, Barrier Island on the East Coast. Uh, it was uh, in the 1950s and 60s when the space program was really taking off. And, and my father, actually, who was a physician uh, in Melbourne, Florida, um, kind of played a role in that in that he did um, pre-employment physicals for the three big uh, rocket companies, basically, that were um, beginning in the space program at that time. So he earned a credential that was called a space pioneer, and he had a pass to all the launches until the day he died. So um, he was very proud of doing that. Um, it was, um, you know, a busy time in, in that area as the area grew. This is a 1954 photo of my family. Um, and, you know, it was just kind of an everyday life like we know. Now I'm very active in our community. One of the things I'm working on now is I'm a co-chair for our new Holocaust Museum of Hope and Humanity that's going to be built in downtown Orlando. And I hope you will look for kind of media about it because I think we'll have some big things coming up soon on some partnerships that are our new museum, uh, hopefully that would open sometime 2023 20, or 24, we'll, we'll be able to talk about it. And it'll be good about getting out the message and my father's story will be told in an, in an exhibit there. So there will be a lot of Czech history that, that makes its way into that museum. So when I was growing up, um, I loved uh, telling what was called the meeting story. And it kind of could outdo anybody in a classroom when you were told to talk about your family because um, the story was pretty dramatic. And I'm going to tell it in more detail. But my simple story was that my father was Czech. And he was Jewish. And when the Nazis came in, he managed to escape to China. And while he was there, he met and fell madly in love with my mother, who was born in China of American missionaries. Um, I knew while I was growing up that we, my father had traveled across five continents before we got to Florida and settled uh, in Brevard County. Um, I, I knew my grandparents my, on the paternal side. I knew my grandparents and my great grandmother had perished in the Holocaust. Um, I knew my father had great bohemian pride. He was, um, you know, always talking about his, his place where he grew up. Um, and I knew that he had been um, uh, born uh, Jewish, was Jewish, but he was from a religious standpoint. He was a professed agnostic when I was growing up. Um, I was raised Presbyterian, and I would say that my how I would describe myself now is kind of spiritual in the end. Um, my my family, I would describe, was kind of all American at that time. After a 60-year love affair, my parents died within two days of natural causes. My mother had Parkinson's disease, and uh, she was 83. My father was 88. We weren't expecting him to pass away, but he did. Um, and they said it was congestive heart failure at that time. And so um, a great discovery was made at that time. The things we really, my brother, sister, and I didn't know existed. And we began with um, a couple of Chinese boxes, one of them pictured there. And inside of them, they were stuffed with old letters. Um, and these are kind of the way those letters look. They were very different uh, handwriting, typewriters, different papers, inks, and everything. And so it was clear they were from all different people. Um, but also significantly, my father had um, typed 70 carbon copies uh, and kept carbon copies of them, of his letters, which were multi-page and very 
uh, very uh, descriptive of what was going on with him, where he was at the time. And most of these were written in China. Um, and also he, he wrote uh, journals and kept notes. So there was much to this uh, collection beyond the letters. There were 135 documents of different kinds that are uh, kind of all from that period of time. There were photographs. My father was really an award-winning photograph um, uh, photographer. And so I have 11 albums um, when he was in China and later when he went to South America. Um, those are his escape pants that he saved. I have seven hours of interviews that I did with my father in 1989. And um, he, he actually described those pants but he didn't tell us that he had saved them. And in fact, in my mother's linen cabinet is where we found them. And my brother and sister didn't know what they were at all, but I recognized them immediately from the interviews we'd done. And there's wonderful stories almost that everything you look at, there'll be a story that I can tell you, but we don't have time today. The artwork on the left there um, is my father's and I'll come back to that in a few minutes. So the Holzer collection um, lived silently in closets and boxes and such. Um, all the years we were growing up. Um, and now it, the collection is not yet at the United States Holocaust Museum. It'll be probably our archive and their archives director uh, came to my home and went through everything a few years ago. Um, and some of it will be on permanent loan to the new museum in Orlando, but it will go as kind of one collection um, is what they told me that they really want it to be like that for, for its value to them. Um, so you can see from these two quotes, it's it's something very special. And the man, Alan uh, Stipe, who did the appraisal, he actually was recommended to me by uh, Henry Mayer of the U.S. Holocaust Museum. And he was amazed at what he thought of it as a check collection. So beginning in 2008, like I said, I retired and it became an absolute obsession then to work with these letters, uh, scan them. Uh, protect them, have them all translated um, and understand and be able to share those. The picture of the paper clips was my dad had a lot of them in groups and I wasn't sure because I couldn't read check, uh, you know, what what the significance was. But it turned out um, there really wasn't any. So so I scanned them in an order that wasn't in, in, a, in any kind of order. So you can imagine uh, at the beginning how confusing all this was sort of as I got um, uh, translations back and, and they were from all different people uh, all over the world. So to understand kind of what it was all about, I had to really go on a worldwide search. So I did that both physically and um, virtually and visited, as you can see, kind of the major museum in Washington. And they really did sort of adopt me and worked with uh, museums in New York and the Czech land, Slovakia, Poland, Germany. Um, and a lot with experts um, who would help me or make introductions or, or who would also do some work for me. Um, my husband and I, <clears throat> this is my husband in the right hand there. He's been everywhere, uh, as he likes to say, he carries my luggage, but that's not just what he does. He does a lot of work uh, helping with understanding what the collection is all about, doing research with me, and he's really enjoying it. But one of the things that we did was visit the four concentration camps uh, and death camps that related to uh, family members um, that were involved in the letters and the stories and such. Um, so these included um, uh, uh, Terezin, Terenstadt, the Terezin, um, Majdanek, uh, Sobibor, and Auschwitz. Uh, we did, uh, I did a lot of research involving the family and friends descendants and even some of the letter writers that were still alive and friends of theirs or people that lived in my uh, father's hometown who remembered him and a lot of um, just research interviews. And again, I engaged experts in almost every area that it touched and this list could probably go on to about 20 different things when you start getting into all the details and you try to understand them even like how world war ii mail moved around censorship a lot of censorship issues that now i understand how it was working it's amazing um, with the international red cross and the role they played and at one point there were 30 million letters that, that had gone through censorship all over the world related to, during that period of time. 
Uh, Chet family reunions. Um, I had, um, we had gone with my father in 1995, myself, my husband, and my son. My daughter wasn't able to go. She was in college. And anyway, so we had, we had met up some of the relatives and we had also um, gone to some of the places, but my father really didn't tell us some of the key places. And I learned it through letters and other research where we wanted to go see. Um, so at that first visit of just my my husband and I, when we went back in 2009, one of the cousins who I'm very close to um, actually set up a family reunion. There were 18 people, the people on the top. You can see that there's um, the, my cousin is on the right there. His name is Thomas uh, Machik. And then there are two um, first cousins, the men uh, of my father. They were very much younger than him, probably 10 or 12 years younger, and then a woman that was married to one of the cousins um, that came and they brought family trees and they brought um, uh, Hanush Holzer, who's in the middle there. He actually was one, uh, one of the surviving children from Terezin. He brought some information and I was able actually through the re research I'd done to identify where his father had perished. He never was really sure. It turned out it was a duck house. Um, so there was a lot of information exchanged and then we all stayed in touch and I actually hired Lukasz Pribble. You can see him on the bottom. He was a, recommended to me by the U.S. Holocaust Museum. Uh, he was making a film at the time uh, called Forgotten Transports. He actually won the Czech Lion, which is the equivalent of our Oscar for best documentary. I think it was in 12, uh, 2012 or somewhere around there. Um, and he uh, actually, as a filmmaker, he volunteered uh, at first to do a book trailer for My Dear Boy, which we did that book trailer long before I ever wrote the book or uh, or um, did it, wrote my first book, Adventures Against Her Will. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that story. But he actually filmed interviews hours and hours, I think, I think six hours with both um, these two gentlemen in the picture to capture their stories, which were very different during the war. Um, and they're very interesting. So they, they too were, were very helpful to me understanding what the letters and who the people were. Um, they both passed away since, um, in the last two years. So my father was born in Beneshoff. It's about 25 miles um, from Prague. It's uh, connected in, in history because it was where the um, uh, presumptive Austria-Hungarian uh, um, next emperor might have been from, um, which was um, the man that was killed uh, in in Sarajevo, which kind of sparked the the uh, First World War. It's given the credit of, of it. So, um, uh, and I just forgot his name, Ferdinand uh, de Este, and his wife lived in a castle in, right there in Beneshoff. So it was um, even, uh, I know my father. Uh, father, my grandfather was friends with the man who was the doctor of him when he would come to town and such. So the, it, it was kind of its claim to fame. So uh, I have a tree that shows now more than uh, 2,000 blood relatives. And many of you may have heard of Randy Schoenberg, but uh, he's very active in the genealogy field. Um, he uh, contacted me in 2013 and told me that our grandmothers he thought were related or he knew were related and would would I let him uh, access my family tree that I had only put in 50 names and it was on genie.com. And Randy since then has been the one that has added all those people to my family tree. It's an amazing gift kind of. And his claim to fame, I guess, he's a successful lawyer in LA, but if anybody saw the movie um, the Woman in Gold that stars Helen Murren, uh, he, he was the young lawyer that actually took that, the case of this stolen art during the, um, uh, that the Nazis had taken. And it was later, uh, they went to court in uh, Austria to win uh, monetary um, and to get some, a lot of the art back or some of the art back. So anyway, he's uh, very active in the genealogy field. So here's here's the kind of a how how convoluted you know all of you who work in in genealogy field know how it can be very strange uh, and you can be many times removed but at any rate that this is our strange relationship. So in 1932, my father um, 
uh, started to attend Charles University and his family there, you know, the economy had dipped in the world and his father um, who ran the uh, family wholesale grocery business uh, in Beneshaw um, closed the store and the, and the house where they lived and they moved with my father to Prague. Um, so they were all in Prague at this time, which was a wonderful time. It was the beginning of, you know, problems, real severe problems around Europe. But it was a time, you know, back when you had the cafes like they had in Paris and in Prague, these uh, wonderful gathering places. And so this features Manish Cafe, Cafe Manish. And there's a picture in 2014. Every time we go to Prague you now, we visit this restaurant, which still operates. And it was well known because it had an artist um, association there, the Monash artists. And several famous artists actually worked in, and exhibited in this hall that you can see in the, uh, that old picture and even in the, in the newer one. But um, my father was one of the people that went there and he took us um, when we went with him in 1995 we walked through this area and he said i used to go there but he never really told any stories about it but in the letters um these are some of the letter writers that you see there that i'll tell you about more later because they're my adventures against their will group and they would talk about Manish in the letters that they wrote. So it was a very special place. And there's also some journal entries and another long story that I got from one of the people I write about in Adventures Against Their Will, who um, was a, a doctor, he wasn't Jewish, um, and he was a good friend of my father. And after the war, he wrote what had happened as he knew it back in, in Prague, but he also writes about Manish Cafe and tells some stories about it. So that is what ended up being my first book, Adventures Against Their Will. It was March of 1939. The world was erupting into violence and the Nazis were invading Czechoslovakia. Families were shattered and life or death decisions had to be made in an instant. This is a story that might never be told if not for a stunning discovery. After her parents died in 2000, Joni Sherm found, hidden in some old Chinese boxes, 400 letters from 78 different writers to and from her father. When translated, the letters revealed an amazing story. I broke down and cried when I read that first letter. It was heartbreaking. The letters were a window into Sherm's past and an unprecedented documentation of events that changed human history. And then suddenly their letters stopped and I had to know more. And so I went in search and I found descendants for them all over the world. Sherm's relentless worldwide search uncovered the true story of relatives murdered in death camps, of young friends and their dramatic escapes to four continents, stories about the will to live, the nobility of human dignity, and the pain and guilt of betrayed lovers and of friends and family left behind. Only rarely does a work of nonfiction have the gripping emotional core of a best-selling novel. Adventurers Against Their Will by Joni Sherm is that rare exception. Former U.S. Secretary of State Madeleine Albright calls Adventurers Against Their Will a brilliant and compelling account of men and women caught in the turbulence of war. Their world is about to explode. Their lives will be changed forever. They're about to become Adventurers Against Their Will. Sometimes fact is even more dramatic than fiction. Uh, so this was um, a book that was spurred on. My father called in a letter some one of his friends describing that they were adventures against their will, and I thought it really did describe. So they were either trapped alive, I mean, trapped in the under the Nazis, um, or they escaped. Most of them had escaped, and they were writing my father mostly in China, but later in South America or in the U.S. where he had gone. And they're telling what they're seeing on their fronts. And I'll, I'll come back to kind of where they all went later. But um, and so it's a very interesting way to know what their knowledge was, um, what their thoughts and their projections were uh, through their letters. So in 1937, my father graduated from Charles University with honors. He was always proud about that. And in fact, when we when we went to we've been to the archives at Charles University a couple times and 
we could see what kind of grades he got and everything. So I know it's whole history while he's there, who his professors were, um, even, you know, they would say what kind of religion you were. And by the way, at the beginning, um, the Czechs were, were, would put that they were Israeli, um, Israelites, and then they would later say they were without um, religion. And it's something that um, one of the people that worked, one of my experts said that became common as kind of the influence of Hitler and what was happening around there that they, that they would change what they said. Um, also, um, this is an, a drawing uh, that my father made of one of the professors. Um, now what do I do? <laughs> okay, so this is this. These are some of the drawings that my father did, which, by the way, were hanging in Charles University in 1995 when we went there. Not these exact ones, because these were ones that he kept, and I have from his collection, but there were other ones that the originals were, were still being hung in the medical center. And this is an example of my husband's research. He was um, intrigued by these and he went on the internet and uh, and he was looking at the uh, look or life, I guess it should be on your life magazines, uh, collection of photos. And it turns out Alfred Eisenstadt, who was a very famous photographer at that time had gone to Prague right after the war and been at Charles University. So my husband actually started matching up my dad's drawings with real people. It was really kind of an exciting moment. So in, so my uh, father was then in the army and when he was when he joined the army, it was compulsory service at that time. They were really, the Czechs were building up a very, very large uh, number of, uh, of people that were in the army and they definitely had uh, a lot of equipment because a lot of the tank makers or other other uh, uh, weapons of war were actually from some of the plants in in Czechoslovakia, like a Skoda or um, I can think of the other one. But anyway, he was he was there at a time when a lot of things that led towards what later became World War II were kind of going on. So in 1937, as an example, this wasn't the first time the Japanese had invaded China, but it was the second scene of China war. And it would become important to my father later, for sure, what happened to him. Um, then, of course, Austria was taken, uh, the Munich Agreement, and Kristallnacht, which was really the, I think of it as the first indication of what the brutality that was about to be unleashed and the horror that came. So these were things that people were seeing and reading about. And in, 19, in 1939, in March, in the middle of March, the, uh, the Nazis marched in and um, took over um, the Bohemia and Moravia, became um, the protector of Bohemia and Moravia. Uh, he in March was in the army and they they their army unit at first when the Nazis came in did not uh, they were on, they didn't know what to do. And so for two weeks, he, he tells me this in the, in the recording in the recordings from 1989. He describes all this and he says, you know, they 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 changed positions and their second position was kind of um, near uh, not too far from Brno and they were hiding out kind of thing. And then the Ger uh, some German officers came by train and they took over his unit. And so for two weeks, he said uh, he wasn't doing anything as the doctor of the unit. So he was the, the um, physician officer. Uh, he, there wasn't much to do. And he was uh, treating runny noses, as he said, and kind of bored. And they were all playing football, soccer. And he decided he wanted to go home. So he asked his driver, he tells me, a man named Vaclav, if Vaclav wanted to go home. He knew Vaclav was actually from that area. And Vaclav said, sure. And so my father said, go get the car and we're going out. And my father sat down and he wrote an order to go inspect the meat. And that was one of the things that he could do as the uh, doctor of the unit, where you'd make sure that the meat supply that was coming to the soldiers was, was okay. And so he wrote the order. He said he put uh, he wrote it in Czech because he knew the Germans wouldn't read Czech that a lot of the Czechs you know knew German but he and he put a lot of stamps on it because he said Germans always like fancy stamps 
And so they took off in the car. And when they got to the gate and the German guard asked him for his order, he handed him the order. And he said he could have read it without reading it. But the German guard said, I can't read this. Would you read this? And so my father read the order that he had given to himself to leave to inspect the meat. And the German said, all is in order and clicked his heels. And my father and Gokloff drove out. So these pants may or may not be the pants that he saved, but they're, they look a lot like them. And that's a photograph that was taken uh, about six months before um, that. And when you come back to this site, if you listen to it again, there, I think we can't play the audio now. It won't work technically, but um, I have my father's voice telling you that story uh, from the tape of his escape. And then I have this one of his uncles um, to his mother's side writes this letter. And my father had told me in the interview who was there to say goodbye. And this is the, the man that wrote the letter that kind of um, captures how it felt or how it looked. Um, I also have that the ticket up there. Um, my father did an escape album and his escape album has all the photos of when he escaped and also his trip um, to China. And it includes uh, many kind of things that you might save when you're on a trip, whether they're tickets or passes. And I also have his um, uh, pictures of his passport. My niece actually has the passport, but so I can tell you everywhere he was and, and the escape um, journal, this uh, uh, album has photos from every port of call that you can see on here and also um, other memorabilia that goes with it, even like menus from the ship and such. So this was a, a 30 day uh, trip really by sea. It's very, I've been told, uh, US Holocaust Museum told me that it was a different kind of route and I'll, I'll tell you why. So my father, um, you know, at the time, at the, this was so this was um, mid March to to May that he was getting all his materials together to leave. Um, it was one. It was a, a period where the Germans really you could you could get out, but it was very made very difficult. Um, so some of the things my father encountered because you, a lot of it, you know, they froze the money, so people didn't have the money really to just to buy a ship ticket and things like that, even though you might have had your other documents. So there was always kind of a catch-22 to a lot of people trying to leave. And my father ended up um, trying to talk his parents into leaving, but they chose not to. My grandfather had been in World War I. He'd actually been sent um, to Russia by the Austria, and he was uh, a prisoner of war. Um, there and he had seen the least, the worst of war. But I think he, like so many of the people that stayed behind and a lot of the Jewish people who stayed, uh, thought this too will pass. And it's, you know, how bad can it be? And they, they just didn't think of it um, as something that was looming to be as bad as it would be. So they chose not to go with him. Um, and my father ended up getting money through what was called the Lord Mayor's Fund, which was um, um, the Quakers in Britain that set up a fund. A lot of people were not happy um, uh, with the Munich Agreement at all. And there was, a, you know, a real uh, a dif difference of opinion in, in Great Britain when that happened. But so when the when the Nazis came in, the Quakers set up a fund and it allowed people to be able to have money to to get ship tickets and then also uh, have money at your destination. So there was a way that my father could get some money when he got to Shanghai as an example. Um, he had to buy, uh, in in China, there was not a requirement in Shanghai, China, that the, the Japanese controlled the port and not all of Shanghai. And there were international settlements there um, that were different presence. So it was kind of a, a different setting in Shanghai that allowed um, people to go there because they didn't have to have at that moment in time a visa or a landing permit that cost a lot of money in a lot of places. And as we know, not a lot of places were uh, accepting people. Their quotas were full around the world and particularly for people of Jewish heritage. 
who were desperate to get out. There weren't places that you could go. So Shanghai turned out to be one place where in the end, 20,000 uh, European Jews made it there. Uh, my father actually had a, a list of what he took with him and he also wrote letters about it. Um, there were things that were required were, by the Nazis in terms of documents and they wanted to make sure you weren't leaving with anything that they could have confiscated. Um, or would confiscate. And so his story, I pretty much have a lot of details of when it happened. Even one of his friends was a, a notary for some of the documents and that sort of thing. So it took about 30 days and he first stopped in Hong Kong, uh, where if you look on the bottom there, the man in the middle is a, a cousin by marriage, kind of a distant cousin, but his name is Leo Lilling. And he was, I have many letters of Leo's and I uh, learned uh, a lot about the role. He really kind of, um, he was wealthy. He was an import exporter. He had a place, uh, uh, an apartment in Hong Kong and in Shanghai. And when my father reached Hong Kong, my father thought about staying in Hong Kong, even though his destination was supposed to be Shanghai, but my dad couldn't find a job and, and Leo was trying to help him find a job. So I have stories on tape and, and in the letters later, what Leo writes. And so my father stops there for a little while and then he goes on to Shanghai. And he wishes to stay in Shanghai, but he can't find a job. There's, uh, he's a doctor and there's many other doctors that are flooding in. He, he actually sets up with another doctor in office, but like he said, they have no patients. And he ends up going to Tsing Tao, working as kind of a, uh, a doctor for, it's a Czech man who had been, they call him an old China hand. He'd, he'd been in China for, since World War I, but he he never learned to speak Chinese, but he was well known and he had a restaurant and my and he had a problem health wise. Um, and so my father actually went to Tsing Tao with him on a trip to to be his doctor on hand. And there's a lot of great stories my father told me there. Um, because he he goes back to Shanghai. He's unable again to find work. He he had a job for a little while at an at a American Red Cross hospital that had opened or clinic that had opened, but then they shut down. And so he finally finds this job in the middle of nowhere, Shanxi province in Ping Ping Xing. And it's an American Brethren Hospital. And my father is hired to um, be the main doctor there once the um uh, the, the missionary doctor that's there is going to go on a sojourn back to America. And my father's supposed to fill in for him. And so he goes there. And as soon as he gets there, he was, there was supposed to be a, uh, a woman that was a German nurse um, that was going to help my father get acclimated and everything. Of course, my father spoke German, um, spoke a little bit of Russian and Czech. And he was learning, since he arrived in China, he was learning both Chinese and English. He knew a little English. His father actually wrote English and spoke a little bit. Um, but so he was filling his head, as he said, with all these different languages. And But as soon as he arrives in Ping Tingxing, the woman that was the German nurse at another hospital that's associated with the one he's in, uh, she catches typhus fever and she dies. And so. Um, it's clear that my father really isn't going to be able to really communicate that well without his um, the Chinese language that well. And so they send him to um, Peking at the time, Beijing, uh, to go to the USC language school that is in Peking. And there's a Rockefeller funded uh, hospital called the Peking Union Medical Center, which is world renowned, very, very state of the art and most state of the art in Asia. And my father goes there. And while he's going to the language school, which is an immersive school, he tells me all about it on tape that, you know, you go in and you can't speak any English or I mean, any Czech, anything except for you have to converse in Chinese from the very beginning. So it's a very immersive thing. He says the best language school he was ever at. He's there for oh, I think it's a three month school, but he leaves um, Beijing and he works part time at the Rockefeller hospital, which is very good because he meets the director while he's there. And so he goes back to Ping Ting Shing. He's in Ping Ting Shing until August. And in August, he takes a train to um, Beijing to buy supplies 
for the hospital that he works at. And he goes by train. I think it's about a six hour train ride back then. And while he's in and when he gets there, the Japanese who are at war with the communists, um, by the way, the communists and the nationalist armies in China join together to fight the Chinese, it, I mean, the Japanese. So they sort of call a truce among themselves, not a totally good one I mean, along the way. But they but the, China, the communists are in the region where my father's hospital is. And I have a lot of either letters or from his journals where he describes what's going on. It's a pretty ruthless warfare going on right around the hospital. So when they get when he gets to Peking, the in the meantime, the Japanese blow up the train track, the bridges, and so he's stranded in um, Peking. And it's meant to be, I believe, because my mother, who had, as I said, been born in China, she had gone back to the U.S. to become a teacher, and she was returning to um, right and with full knowledge that there was the war of the Japanese and the Chinese going on. Uh, she returns to China to teach in the mission field and where she's born. And the, and one of the um, uh, missionaries that she had even known when she was small, who had now grown up and gotten married, his wife had went, gone to the um, language school at the same time as my father. And so she is friends with him, and she tells my father that there are these young missionaries coming, three of them, uh, coming, and she's going to have a tea for them. So she throws this tea. And my, and my father, I have him on tape, and I have my mother on tape, both describing the moment in which they saw each other. And I can tell you, it was definitely love at first sight for both of them. And they have a very quick courtship. And eight days later, he asked her to marry him. And the letter on the, on the left that you see there um, is the letter that my mother wrote her parents telling them that by the time they get this letter, she'll be married to this Czech army officer. So imagine her, her missionary parents in shock. I can tell you stories about that because I've learned they were in shock when they got that letter. So anyway, they are married. They, uh, they have, I have details about their marriage. I have notes from the people that went there who I did research. Some of them are famous scientists. There were only 2,000 foreigners that were in Peking at that time. So they... Uh, they're in China and they, they marry in October and then the uh, warfare in that area of the world is kind of ratcheting up. Um, so the American embassy recommends that uh, all the foreigners, actually all the, the um, uh, legations there that are in, in Peking are recommending that the foreigners leave. And my father, my mother and father start trying to get, my mother decides because when my mother left China, it was during a time of kind of uh, anti-activities towards the missionaries and been very dangerous and the people, and that when they were standing, when my mother's family was standing on the dock they were on to leave on a ship to go back to America, the, the, it, the people had burned down that dock and it was very scary. So my mother was kind of, she was afraid to stay really uh, another time like this and wanted to come back later, but she chose to, to leave. And my father tried to get his paperwork and there was anti-Semitism by someone in that um, office in Peking. And luckily my father had met one of the senior people at the em embassy who would go back and forth between the main office and the legation office. And he really liked my father and he quickly got it so that his paperwork was done too. And he was able to go on a preferred I think they called it a preferred visa because he was married to my mom now. So they set off for America and they land in L.A. and they go to into Long Beach. And my father and mother both get a job at the hospital um, at Seaside in Long Beach, California. They are I have a lot of more letters, people writing them there and and also uh, stories from my father. And I know that. Um, I have a story of him telling all about when Pearl Harbor, when that when that bombing happens and how it all unfolded for them. And then my father, who had been who had tried to um, register at one point, but hadn't registered yet at the at the um, uh, with the military there um, for the draft office or anything. He um, he then decided that now and my mother wanted to go see her parents who were at that time uh, living on the East Coast. So they go. Uh, to the East Coast, and on the bottom there, you'll see the picture of my dad. He actually went and met with um, 
uh, General George Marshall, who, you know, the name of the Marshall Plan later, it's about that he was the uh, Army Chief of Staff. And my father had an interview with him because he wanted to join, but everywhere he was talking and trying to fill out paperwork, nobody would because he wasn't a citizen. But more so, he was also still an officer technically in the Czechoslovak Army, which of course didn't exist except in exile. And, they, and General George Marshall told him he needed to, to um, get out of that obligation first. And he also told him that he should go and, and practice medicine for a while and, and do a residency and, and that. And so, he ends, so they end up going to different places. So they end up in, in Illinois, in, in Purdue, yeah, I mean, Indiana. And they, um, and my father actually becomes a citizen when they're there. And, he, and my brother, Tom, is, is born there. And then all the while he's been wanting to serve and there was a shortage in America. So they were kind of even hospitals where he worked were not wanting him to leave and made it difficult. And I have a file about an inch thick between him and the military and these hospitals and everything else. Long story short, finally, there was something that the American Medical Association and the um, military worked together where they would place doctors um, in different positions. And so they actually chose some British oil fields in South America where 100% of the oil was going to um, the military effort. And so my parents were both in Purdue, um, Peru and Ecuador. My sister was born in Ecuador and they were there when um, uh, v, v E Day, VJ Day, and yeah, and they were, and I have a lot of stories about that. They're interesting just on, on stories of South America and what their engagement in the, in the war was about, even that um, is fascinating. But so my father decided when they came back to the U S that uh, um, he wanted to join on which um, the war was over. He wasn't sure what he wanted to do. I know now that my through letters that my mother and father wanted to go back to China and that they wanted to open their dream was to open a, a charity hospital and a school and my father um, uh, decided a good way would be to go back and work on UNRWA which was the largest relief act ever in the world I guess thus far and so they were rebuilding hospitals as in, in his part of what he was doing they're rebuilding and, and supplying and uh, you know just bringing back the medical field in a devastated country. And then, um, of course, the communists then began to become stronger. And finally, UNRWA was, they were driven out of, they left. And so my father uh, came back to Long Island where he got a job in a hospital there. And they were there, it was the coldest winter. He told me that, and then when I looked it up, it was true, it was the coldest winter. Um, the year that they were there. And so he was actually thinking about, wouldn't it be nice to live somewhere where it was warmer? He looked in an American medical journal and he saw a job that was available in Florida at Chattahoochee. And this hospital, it's the, it's the state mental hospital or what they used to call insane asylum. And I was actually born there. I was born in December of 1948. And when I started reading about the history of Chattahoochee, there was even a, uh, uh, a chart that showed there was only one person who was born at the hospital by being, uh, um, was born there naturally um, in that same month. So everybody else was admitted because they had uh, mental issues, but I, I was born there. So it used to be kind of in Florida, it was hard to even say you were from Chattahoochee because people would always kid you about it, but it was a ser very serious uh, hospital that was, closed not too, not too long after I was born. Um, it still has some presence in, in the panhandle. It still has some uh, use there. So then it was uh, my father uh, took over for a doctor um, in Chipley who they had lost their last doctor and it was right nearby Chattahoochee. So he was also doing that. And then he, a friend of his who had been a dentist at Chattahoochee Hospital um, moved to uh, Brevard County. And that was how my parents learned about opportunity, great opportunities there. And so they moved to Melbourne Beach in India Lane. So their life there was uh, a wonderful life. It was a great place to grow up. And it was a very you know, small town, but, but booming and a lot of 
uh, wonderful friends were made there. And my father was a very compassionate physician, very well loved there. Um, he did a lot of work pro bono. He was known for that in many, many different ways he served. And the same for my mother. My mother was a teacher by profession, but she became a big community activist and very involved. And, and so they led a good American life there. Um, so a lot of things happened back home during and after the war. I will tell you that my father ended up uh, for the first time returning in 1963 to Czechoslovakia was under the communists. And I have much about his return and uh, what happened there. And only one of his um, father's siblings, Aunt Vala, uh, Vala Mashik, um, survived in her family. She was in a mixed marriage. And there's a lot of story that goes with that. But um, what had happened, the first letter that I had translated and I had no idea what it said, but I realized the date of it was significant because I realized when my grandparents had been taken to Terezin at, and it was at this time. And um, so I saw it and had it translated. And it is kind of my, I would say, my North Star to everything I'm doing, because in it, uh, my grandfather, who is who is essentially writing a goodbye letter to my father and and making a wish for him. And he describes that they're, they've been called to go as they usually would get three days. Um, when the uh, Jews in Prague were called, they would go to a certain site to wait and then be taken to where, um, to Terracine. And so um, this is his goodbye. And in this letter, again, this is the way I met my grandfather, got to know him, fell in love with him and immediately mourned his loss. So it was a very, very difficult uh, letter to read. But in it, he's talking to my father about his profession. And I learned that my father had always wanted to be this and that he wishes that his profession of curing um, doesn't just become a source of wealth for you, but that you yourself become a benefactor to the suffering humanity. And when I read that, I realized that was exactly the life that I saw my father living. It was the way he lived his life in so many different ways. And so it kind of told me I had something special to do and I needed to share that message, which is which is a message that never goes away for all of us, but particularly with all the situation with refugees and displaced persons even today. So the Holocaust Museum thinks that my grandparents uh, likely perished in Sobibor death camp in Poland by train records of when they left. They were actually taken away pretty early in the massive process um, in April, and they were right away in May sent from Terezin, where other relatives that went stayed at Terezin for a while and then were sent off, most of them, to Auschwitz. Uh, one, this one surviving aunt that I told you, Aunt Bala, and her husband and two sons end up surviving, and, and I got to meet them several times. Um, then, of course, the communists took over, um, and there was again persecution in, in, to uh, Jews in Czechoslovakia. Um, there were, my father visited 10 times. My mother went with him always. Uh, he, he, um, celebrated in a big way when the Velvet Revolution came. And um, in 1993, when Schindler's List came out, which, by the way, was the, first, was the year that the U.S. Holocaust Museum opened. So that was the first time that real information was available to you. But through hearsay on visits and such, my father, it turned out, knew a much greater story than he'd ever say, said to us. So he sat down and he typed this list, and this is the list of his relatives that he knew of and what happened to them. So he, the only people that he gets wrong on here is he thinks his parents died at Auschwitz. He's got codes there that, you know, go with the names and everything. Um, and I did research, actually the U.S. Holocaust Museum did all the research for me to look and see where all these people died. But my father rebuilt a life away from his homeland like so many people did. And since we're talking about the Holocaust, I thought to put some numbers in here just kind of to remind everybody. My dad, I was told by um, one of the researchers at the Jewish Museum that my dad was one of 26,000 people who legally emigrated. But remember, my dad bought a bought a black market visa and all kinds of things. So when he gathered it, there's more stories to him gathering his materials. It's 
that that was the legal way to get out at that time. There were 44 relatives. Um, there's really more than that when I start looking at all the numbers and the extensive work that uh, Randy Schoenberg's done. Um, there's a lot more that died, but you can see the numbers that kind of go with what happened. And, um, and, and then it's important to remember that right after um, the war there, uh, in 1945, the number of, of Jews was very diminished. And then, of course, you had uh, the communism come in. And so the number really hasn't rebounded. And some might be that because people aren't registering in some way. I don't know. But this was a number that came from 2018. So the story of my father, I, I began writing just when I started doing my research, I started writing stories because I had so much on tape and I had all these different disparate stories. But in the end, because my father said in letters that he intended to write his own book when he was in China, he said that I decided at some point that I would needed to be his ghostwriter and, and do that for him. So that's the story is told in in his voice. And I have materials that go with every little piece of it. And I've tried to on the history side of it, educate people along the way. So if he could know history, I wasn't writing things that now may be greatly studied and put back, you know, into uh, a more comprehensive history. I wrote it so that it, he would know things and I'm, how he would know them and that sort of thing. So you're learning history at the same time. You're learning my dad's story. But I like to say I, I work very hard to get the story out, but I also want to get the story in. And by that, I mean, I want people to associate with my father. He's an everyman kind of story of somebody that went through this and ended up rebuilding his life and doing something good. And so the story, I want people to feel it and feel what he went through and then look back in their own past. And particularly when you do family history, you discover many stories. Joni Sherm thought she knew all about her Czech American father and his epic story. Drafted into the army, the cultured young physician fought Hungarians and Poles in a futile attempt to prevent the dismemberment of Czechoslovakia. The only place where I could get a visa was China. Following the Nazi occupation of his country in 1939, the Jewish soldier's daring escape from a prisoner of war camp took him through France, Egypt, Yemen, Djibouti, India, Sri Lanka, Singapore, and the Philippines to China. Instead of settling in Shanghai like most European refugees, Oswald Holzer went to practice medicine in a small hospital in the war-ravaged interior where Chinese nationalists, communists, and the Japanese fought bloody pitched battles. Speaking was a charmed city, a city full of romance. During a short stay in Peking, he met Ruth Alice, the daughter of American missionaries. My English at that time was about as equally bad as my Chinese but we could uh, communicate quite well. And after about a week or 10 days, I asked her to marry me. And to my greatest surprise, she agreed. Oswald Holzer and the love of his life spent 60 years together. They eventually settled in Florida and raised an all-American family. After they died within two days of each other in 2000, their daughter Joni found a Chinese lacquer box locked away in her father's study. The box was full of brittle old letters. Upon reading them, Joni realized that behind her father's contagious smile was a man she did not know, that there were things he told her and much that he didn't. Buried beneath personal pain was a lesson for all mankind. 400 letters, 
78 writers, one remarkable secret 